Well, okay, that's that's just uh, my web page up here, and uh, uh, this is uh, the new addition I made to it. Um, I call it a uh, tetraisotropic coil. In other words, it's a tetrahedron. And uh, let's see, how do I stop this? Stop share. And I can show you right here. I don't know if you can see well enough. This is the actual model, handmade model that I made. Um, it's actually a number of different things going on inside our coils, flat coils, and also around the whole outside is, is a different coil. But so it's, I'm trying out a lot of different coil kind of things. This one is dissected. So you can see the coil part. And, you can see those are individual wires. And I put the uh, tape foil over it um, because it's a diamet diamagnetic material. I want the diamagnetism to stop leakage through the, the vertices, the line of the vertices. There's actually a, a, a fourth coil that goes against it. So that it's a tetrahedron. Uh, and uh, what happens, normally coils are just you know one, one pull straight through. Um, if you put four of those poles together, you're trying, what I'm trying to do is to make an isotropic effect. I'm trying to have all the poles force into a common center. Uh, this is a, a thought that has uh, grabbed my mind for a long time, but I've never, I've never quite got around to the level that I did this winter to actually build stuff like this. I mean, that, that's just hours and hours of trying to put that together. And uh, this was the one that worked best because these are like plumbing tubing, like plastic tubing that it works like a clamp and it squeezes because you want to squeeze. These coils are basically partitions of the inside of a tetrahedron. So you have the orange copper going all the way around. That's the tetrahedron. And then inside is, is uh, the coils, the largest circular coil that you could fit in, one from each face. Each face has one of those. This is just a thing to to hold it up in the air uh, while I did some testing. And uh, the all these four coils are connected together. This is one end, that's one you know, one wire. Let's see, here's a wire. <laughs> okay, I guess the camera, can, you can't see the wire in my fingers. That goes into the coil there. And then it comes out here. Here's another, this one actually has a alligator clip. These are, you know, for electronic testing. So basically I power it up with DC because if you remember, you know, in uh, school, they had a DC magnet. I don't know, in my school, we had a nail, an actual nail with wire wrapped around it, or that was Boy Scouts actually. Um, and we had to make a magnet and uh, it, it, you know, it, it, that's an electromagnet. Now that's DC. What I really wanted to get to was AC and I never quite got to, to AC, but um, because uh, with this particular, because my, my machinery is broken down. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my test equipment. So uh, here, this is all on my website. This picture shows, can you get an isotropic field out of this? Uh, this was the same thing on the left. It was the one that was not squeezed enough. So on the right, you see where I did squeeze it a lot. And yes, I did get the uh, isometric field effect where you put a compass next to each central part of that tetrahedron on each face. And they all had the same um, polarity. In other words, all north or all south, depending which way you attached the DC current. Anyway, uh, so this is a sort of simplified, uh, it tries to be a simplified diagram to show it only has three turns on each face and three magnetic turns. And you, you're looking to the top left, I mean, to the left top, yeah, th that's the top view. And then, you know, it says top, front, side, and a 60 degree angle looking at the tetrahedron. If you're fam familiar with the tetrahedron, would, would show you that that, okay, that, that's the tetrahedron. And actually it, it's a, a recessed uh, tetrahedron because you see the shading from the CAD imagery shows that you have partitions going inside the tetrahedron. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to partition each face of the tetrahedron to give one pole and I managed by electrically connecting them together to get them all to have the same pole, which is sort of unusual. Um, it, it, what, what has not been done yet is uh, the, uh, the first model, the hand-built model I showed you is a bit messy still, and you do get leakage there, but uh, the uh, attempt will be to make better and better versions. Uh, this is still the same first ones. And uh, here are 
for instance, uh, here are three co three coils on the right hand side, and I put I made kind of a magnetic four branched uh, core. Uh, now the cores kind of mess up your compass because anytime a compass gets near a piece of iron, it's going to be more attracted to the iron than it is to you know weak uh, magnetic current that you try to use. Now you can't use strong currents with a coil like this because uh, it, it'll just uh, heat up the wire because uh, that's the way coils are. The, the only way you can keep the coil cool is if you use alternating currents that will not heat the magnet up because uh, it, uh, the induction, uh, the, uh, mag the magnetism is reversing and all the energy is going into that. It's not going into heating up the coil. Anyway, um, I'm trying to explain a lot of things. Uh, more detail can be read in the, in the writing. Uh, this uh, graphic in the middle here shows that I tried to wire the four coils, those little curly things, or each one is, is one of the faces of the tetrahedron. And uh, the other lines show how the wires were connected. So I tried different connections. Now, when you do this with something like, you know, the messy system I had in the beginning, still have, it, it tends to fray the wires or bend the copper and it breaks, you know, things like that. So it's a constant effort to get these to work, to, to do what you want. And uh, here again is a close up, and it shows that I did, you know, with the uh, equipment I'm using, with the tools, these are all sort of hand, handmade jigs that I have. Um, I wasn't able to get the coils as, as cleanly. I wanted to make a one clean surface, but you see to the right, the, uh, the conic coil got a little, you know, a little messy. And the center that I started from was, was a bit warped. Uh, so I really have to make this part, uh, the tool that I use, this jig, has to be made with a lathe. I didn't have a lathe at the time. And besides, that's a whole extra job. I, I was trying to do this without too much uh, distraction, which uh, it could easily get distracted. Um, here again is the, the, the coil I showed you that was torn apart, the other version. Uh, and here is uh, trying to use just three instead of all four faces. These are just three faces. I talk a little bit about my work for that. Um, and uh, here's a graphic that shows how the partitions of a tetrahedron work, um, that you see that the, uh, each edge ha goes inward to an inner edge, so to speak. And uh, that, that's, these are the partitions I'm trying to explain how the, how the magnetic fields occupy those volumes. Each partition is sort of a volume. Um, here are just uh, four views. I, I tried to color each face a different color red, blue, green, and yellow at the bottom. And you, so in CAD, you can have a top view, front view, right view, underside, perspectives. That's what I show there. I have a lot of links going to other uh, web pages that I dealt with these, these particular issues. Here was another, uh, the same uh, project this uh, last few weeks. I tried to make it with metal. This metal happens to be a, a, a very magnetic kind of a nickel, a nickel alloy of some kind. So I would, I would make the, the first pattern flat, print that out on a printer, and then use that to trace out on these metal, on a flat sheet of metal. And then you can see the tape going along the right-hand side, the tape going along where, I, where the seam was brought together. And that, that folds it up into a, a coil shape, a cone, a cone shape. Um, here are more pictures trying to describe this work. <clears throat> and this relates to uh, the uh, fundamental particle idea, and I, I have a link going back to that page, which I actually rewrote a couple of months ago. Um, now this is sort of going way back uh, into what was that called? The pre something, Al? I can't, <laughs> can't remember what you used. Anyway, this is back in the 80s, actually. I think I drew this, or maybe in the mid early 1990s or late 18, 1980s. Um, if you look closely at those line drawings, I'm showing that. You have red arrows, which show the direction of the uh, electrical flow, because this is kind of like for a basket, which I'll show shortly. And then the green are the circular reaction of mag magnetism. Uh, this was definitely in, in the late 1980s. I started, this is a tennis ball you see in this picture, and it has wire, wire coils wrapped around it, and those get hooked up differently. and. Uh, I mean, you see also a little ball bearing inside that hollow tennis ball. And when you power that up, that little ball flops around inside there. 
Um, but uh, also the other thing, the main thing with the, what Little I was able to do with the oscilloscope was to show that uh, it is, there is a tendency towards forming uh, harmonics, which means you, you put in, you input one frequency and you reach a certain resonant point and suddenly the coil responds with echoes of a higher frequency, so to speak. That's where the, that's my interest in the harmonics. Now, of course, uh, uh, most electronic technicians would think of harmonics. Oh, that's what makes noise in my system. I got to get rid of that. I got to filter that out. Well, sure enough. But uh, in this case, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to go into harmonics and see if it is possible to multiply frequencies. Okay, here's another coil uh, with a link showing how it was made. I don't know if you can see two pictures. Can you see two pictures in a screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the bottom picture shows that you take, uh, you, you wind up these copper coils and you flatten them down on the table on the surface. And inside, you also have a magnetic wires. Uh, that happens to be nickel wire. That's why it's shiny. Uh, and so I had two coils. I put one inside the other and flattened it down like that. And then I, I, I uh, curled it around to the top picture. I curled it around and nested it inside a plastic, uh, you know, a plastic uh, jar there that was cut off. And that forms a very specialized kind of a toroidal coil, except it's not really a true toroid because all the uh, all the axes of each turn has its own axis, so to speak, and they're all aiming towards the center. And this was sort of an earlier attempt, uh, you know, trying to rationalize: can you get something like um, this isotropic effect? This is not much isotropic. This is more radial effect. It gives anyway. This is earlier work, and I'm sh these are showing the history. Okay, now this is a missing picture that somehow the link is wrong. I, I got it. I've got to work on it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get it all ready, but uh, this is the first day I put this up. Now, here we get to the basket again. Um, the basket is actually made somewhere, I think in Thailand, perhaps, uh, and it's just an ordinary basket. And then I, uh, I had this sort of putty, this sort of sticky kind of putty, and I was able to insert all these interior coils. Once again, I'm trying to aim, is it possible to aim a lot of magnetic axes all into one common act? Uh, center, sorry. And uh, of course, this is not a full sphere, but it just, uh, it's just working with the hands, trying to see how, to, how, how can something like this come together. This was not really useful because there's too many spaces in between the coils. But, uh, and also, by doing this kind of work, even though you know it's not going to be a finished product, you're getting experience. And experience of making things is the key to trying to, to move ahead. And this is this has sort of been a lifetime uh, effort of uh, trying to gain experiences and putting them together. Well, there's another missing picture. And here, uh, the one picture showing now is uh, showing how uh, to the right, you see how a flat uh, printout of a, a pattern to make a, a partition for the interior of a tetrahedron. I don't know if that was too long a, a terminology or not. But anyway, I'm showing that ideally, if, if you're familiar with um, uh, circuit boards, there's been a long practice of making uh, electronically printing circuits. I'm not talking about miniature, you know, nanoscale. I'm, I'm talking about during the 50s and 60s, somebody came up with a copper clad board and you would print something like a, uh, like a you know, a Xerox, a picture, and the, the, the black uh, print would form a protective uh, image on top of the copper foil. Then you dip that whole coil inside a bath, which etched away wherever uh, the, uh, which was still exposed. So the copper that was exposed would etch away and the copper that was underneath the printed area, that would remain intact and you could make circuits that, that way. And then of course, they weren't making this thing. <laughs> they were making uh, circuit boards, which you, if you Google circuit board, you'll see that it's still a process still used to manufacture electronic uh, circuit boards. Uh, they uh, basically have a lot of holes in them and you, you, you uh, stick in each hole, you stick a wire of a part or a whole chip. It'll have many holes for a chip and each hole goes through to a contact point. Okay, I'm not trying to explain the whole thing of circuit boards, but I'm trying to say is that I'm, I'm taking the circuit board idea and trying to make a coil out of it like this. And each coil would make one interior uh, section of a tetrahedron. 
And this would give a much uh, more accurate um, interfacing of coils with much less of that leakage space that I talked about in the first picture. Leakage meaning magnetic leakage where the other pole is trying to get out somewhere and it'll, it'll get out you know, like a leak. Uh, so uh, you want to keep that, that other pole in the center. How do you do that? Well, you do that with much tighter uh, units as this printout here is, it intends to show. Uh, however, also there's more to it than this one middle picture. This, this has to actually be a two-sided circuit board, which is actually a, a common thing in electronics. Some of them have two faces that are etched out and each face has wires that would otherwise cross and touch each other. Having two faces, they don't touch each other and you can keep two separate circuits like a sandwich. <laughs> so uh, in any case, if I would apply to the middle picture here, I would apply that. Uh, you, you could have two coils that would interface that way. And uh, oh yeah, how, do you, how could you ever possibly get where, where, it's, where that gap is? How do you connect those wires? Well, today there's a fantastic new soldering paste, which a person just sort of splashes onto their circuit board and then they, they apply a heat gun. They don't use a flame, but they apply a very hot air gun and the, the hot air evaporates all the liquid that was splashed on and it leaves the solder only at the exact uh, locations of copper. So that's how it would get the whole circuit would be uh, completed in that manner. Okay, moving on. This is another idea I had going way back, which uh, is also related because what, you're, what I'm doing here is using a sphere to uh, uh, have sort of a uh, reflexive, uh, <laughs> a reflexive, a reflexive circuitry from the outside. It goes up to one pole, then it comes back around inside, insulated from the outside, and it goes back and forth in a reflex fashion. I, I'm afraid that uh, more than that, I, I would have to move on to these other pictures. And each of these pictures, you can see there's a lot of links try to explain what this reflex thing is all about. Anyway, uh, as time passed, I, I made the second picture here. And then this third picture shows, well, what if you add to that this idea of coils? So you have a lot of coils on the right-hand side of the picture. That's seven conductors that do what the one conductor on the left side is. And uh, that would be quite a, quite a field, uh, electrical field. But um, once again, I'm looking for how, how can isotropic effects, or if not entirely isotropic, what kind of effect actually is it? Okay, moving on again. Uh, this was 2016. I, uh, I was playing around with this coil. I, I thought by making this coil, if you look at it carefully, the coil, you can see that uh, the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a broken coil. It's a broken cylinder, so to speak. Those are all copper wires wound up and it's two layers of copper wires and all the, it's all just one wire, which keeps looping back and forth around the broken seam in the cylinder. And uh, what I discovered there was uh, to my great surprise that something, it's, it appeared to have a radial field, radial meaning that let's say the North Pole was sticking all out or all in. Like you see on the left-hand side, you see the compass which is pointing towards the center. And the compass would do that all the way around when it was energized. And I said, wow, how could that be? I mean, I wasted a lot of time being surprised. But of course, later on, I found it was actually two effects going on here. And I explained why, why it was two effects. And uh, <laughs> the result of it was that, yes, you can get a radial coil, coil a radial pole, but uh, axis. And it, it shows you in the middle how you can do that with two coils, it had to do with a break. A break meaning this top coil actually had a defect where there was leakage coming out and the leakage happened to be radially aligned. It was, it was quite, quite interesting that way. Anyway, so I'm exploiting it in this next picture, I'm exploiting that to the right. And to the left, I'm also showing that you have like a U-turn and then you can get the, the see in the middle of this image, you see a U-turn. I don't know if you see my uh, cursor going around the middle here. But uh, that shows where the U-turn is. And that U-turn is, for instance, on this coil, uh, that's the U-turn. Um, there's two U-turns, actually many U-turns. Anyway, so these are different variations in which 
try to eke out, let's try to fathom out what the heck is going on here. By doing these in different ways, I gained some experience as to which uh, physical thing caused a physical reaction and what reaction did it cause. Okay, moving on, that gave me this idea of uh, making these kind of snail-like coils. And uh, that's also discussed, I show pictures of it. And we are getting down to the end. And finally, at the end, we have this uh, trihedral uh, coil that happens to be a spiral as well as a tetrahedra. Actually, it's a trihedron. And it's basically, it's, it's well, I think it's better explained on the website than I can possibly, I'm sure I got, uh, I'm, I'm sure I've lost you know, the train of thought here. So I probably shouldn't try to, um, you know, try to exacerbate uh, explaining it over and over. But uh, it uh, basically, it, 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 this also lends to the isotropic effect. And it goes back to the very, very first isotropic coil, I'm calling it tetra isotropic. And I say tetra because I think all the polyhedra, maybe not every last one, but I think many of those, these polyhedra will be able to uh, uh, employ a coil on each face, so to speak, with the partitions, the way I did it, and ideally with printed circuits. Um, and that would uh, possibly uh, add more, add more, uh, add more axes, which instead of just having four axes now, or four poles, it would have as many as the polyhedron has. And then uh, going back to the bottom, um, the, uh, this being just three coils on a trihedron, tetrahedron means four, tri means three. So trihedron, you have these three phases. You put two of those together at the base and you'll get the hexahedron, right? So that's why I uh, still credit this trihedron is that it's just half of a, half of a, a whole. <laughs> if it's a hexahedron, the trihedron is just half. But still, even with the uh, with the atomic uh, ideas that people have, mine are so extremely far outside of you know what the, what the usual ideas are. But uh, I'm still I'm still lean, leaning towards this trihedron as being the uh, as being the uh, 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 fundamental particle, which finally you have you have three, you have the forces that have come together into a trihedron and they're mobile because they have an open base. And when two of them get together, that begins to build the elementary particles. Anyway, that's, that's, a, that's all uh, linked here. And I think that's, that's what I'll leave you with for now, that uh, that's, that's my presentation. So that's it. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to respond. Very interesting, Bo. I really enjoy this. I'm, I'm getting a lot yeah, out of it. And I want to review it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah Bo, I, I, Bo, in the compasses, what was the what was the black indicator pointing to? They were both the same in both photographs. Excuse me. Go down to the go down to the page that has some, your device. The two devices showing the compasses. The compass? Yeah. Keep oh, on. okay. The, at the bottom. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. What's the question? There you go. The the black arrow in both the right and left picture point in the same direction. What axis is it? At? Oh, the the compass is uh, that that's a field compass, like for uh, geologists or hunters, and the black is part of the encasement, the plastic encasement. And when they want to remember an angle that they have been navigating out in the field, they can turn that black arrow in any direction they want. And they can just- Yeah, I, I get that. I know it's an orienteering compass. I have a few of my own. I was just wondering if, if the black arrow was, uh, if that was just by coincidence, just ignoring yeah, that, that stuff. Indeed, right, exactly, yes. Okay. So, Bo, it, it looks like you're trying to produce a magnetic monopole. Is that what? Yeah, I've heard that word, but uh, I, I, you know, the, I, I don't know that there has been an official monopole, and I don't know if this is it either. Uh, I, I'm calling it isotropic because I'm interested in something that's not just radial. You know, where I showed you a lot of radial examples, um, and this coil also had initially it was red as a radial. A phenomena, but 
as I found out later, it was actually two different phenomena going on. But uh, so yeah, the monopole might, the word might fit in there. I don't know, but uh, do you have something more uh, exact to say about monopoles that I'm missing? Um, I, I, I've done some similar experiments with permanent magnets. Yeah. Where you just try to surround a sphere with all the north poles pointing inwards or outwards to kind of get that same effect and, and if you, you know trying to look so it made it look like inside there'd just be one uniform well I, I didn't know what it would look like inside the sphere with, with all the north poles facing inwards so i i because I, I think in nature monopoles don't exist i mean this it's in a dipole north south Whereas a little bit different from uh, the electron or electrical charge, you can have a single point charge that's always radiating out, you know, an electric field in the same direction. But they don't have the equivalent in magnetism, where if you've got a magnetic particle with lines of force all radiating out, there's always a bipolar uh, arrangement. So. Yeah, but but we can do shading. Uh, we can shade, we can overcome, we can make a dominant field, um, and that's that's used in various ways. Um, and uh, I, I'm not saying it's really just one pole because I have. You see, in this picture, you have these tiny little compasses which aren't entirely clear. I didn't want to do any photo touching because I wanted to be able to say no, that's the exact original photograph. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, in fact, each of those compasses. I do point, you know, as as a radial effect, but I wanted to see what it would do at the center. I can't remember what the center did, one did here, but uh, in this picture, but uh, basically, I'm thinking that there is actually a pole inside there, and uh, I I think uh, the tetra to to do the experiment that you first mentioned, uh, Gary, uh, you know, we could make magnets in the shape of those partitions, and the reason we would start with a tetrahedron is because We'd only have to make four magnets. If we made a geodesic, goodness, we'd have to make a hundred magnets. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's that kind of thing. You know, I'm, maybe it would be the same effect. I don't know. I would. I think it's fascinating. But then there's a leakage, and then you'd have some. Uh, you, you know, some nerd would come in and say, "Ah, I found a leak." You know, <laughs> so uh, you know, we have to. This is all just uh, hypothetical stuff, and. I'm doing it for the experience. The experience is what drives me forward in life. That, that, that's the fun part. Yeah, exactly. The fun experience, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I've made many of these coils similar to what you've done. And <clears throat> one thing you could try, because I know it's hard to make a coil on a curved surface. And what I do, I put one layer down and then a layer of nail polish. Let that dry in it. And add it layer by layer by putting a, like a nail polish or a light epoxy to keep it in place. Yeah, like that. that that's yeah, that's a challenge. I with, yeah, I use double-sided tape here um, to hold it down. It wouldn't stay at all if you didn't have the double-sided tape. But uh, we're, we're, we're have, I have to use my hands to push it down onto the double-sided tape. And that contaminates the, the next roll of tape. So there's always that fight. But what's really on here is to the left, you see, I had to make this part um, hard to explain. It's actually I had to use that metal, that metal form. I don't know where that metal form went to, but wherever it is, um, to make that cone shape. Because if you just try to press it down on the paper alone, the paper's not strong enough to press. You know, your your thumb pressing the wire down to the double sided tape, it, it's not enough. But uh, and besides, I don't want to get high on the nail polish. You know, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty potent. Bo, yeah. Bo, what if you sprayed the cone with uh, contact uh, cement? I agree. Did they try that? I, I agree. The reason I chose the tape is because you're not time limited. And the contact cement is really quite quite powerful. If you make a mistake, you can't correct it. You know, you once the wire goes down, hey, you're not going to... You might have to pull pretty hard to, to move that wire and get it in the yeah. right place. Okay. Um, but the I, I the, the tape I used was, I think, 3M brand, a pretty good tape. But I found a better tape now that I might try if I do this again. I, I What I really want to do is just quit this project for now because I have so many other things piling up uh, to deal with. But um, yeah, the, I, I was thinking of that. Uh, I, I, once again, I don't like... Uh, 
you know, spray things that smell. This is indoors, it's winter. I don't want to open the window. You know, I want to economize on the heat, et cetera. You know, outdoors, yeah, I suppose. But even outdoors, you know, I think it wasn't California the place where they said uh, you can't use spray cans anymore. You have to because it's messing up the ozone layer or whatever. You know? <laughs> so, uh, Bo, how about how about this? There's a uh, a sheet of stickiness that yeah. is used to trap mice. And glue it pads. really it really is sticky, but it doesn't smell. Yeah, glue pads, right. All right, that's what double-sided tape is. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's very compact uh, and there's less waste, uh, you know, because if you start cutting up the glue pad and some of them are pretty thick, you know, you yeah. don't want a thick adhesive. Right. You, the tackiness, you have to be getting the right kind of tackiness so you can be pretty fussy. I found a pretty good new kind of tape. Um, also, I don't want too much thickness because if you're building up thickness there, um, you're, you're interfering with your other properties that you're trying to uh, enhance. For instance, yeah. I showed the picture where I'm trying to use the metallic, you know, the metal alloy because it's a magnetic alloy. But then again, uh, with metals, you also have to be careful because um, if you're getting into higher frequencies, you don't want a ferromagnetic alloy. And that's just gonna kill, you know, it's gonna kill your higher frequency effects that you're trying to gain. So, but I, I don't even, I can't even do that now. As I explained, I, I don't have that equipment working anymore. I gotta, gonna have to upgrade that stuff someday. But uh, anyway, I publish it sort of as an open source thing. And, uh, you know, I actually, at the bottom, I, I, I made a mention of, uh, of uh, the, the website, uh, what is it called? I say, I will paste a discussion at Field Structure Institute. Yeah. <laughs> so if we could figure out a link, we're to have a uh, discussion. Maybe that would be a way to get some uh, traffic. If, you know, if it's desirable, I'll I'll be glad to put a link in there. Oh, I think we should definitely do that. Okay, very good. Bo, well, I have a question for you. Um, sure. Lo looking at the uh, where you had a little below with the uh, the spiral of the uh, where you were making the spiral itself on the like yeah, if if. What, what, what I was thinking of as there, that sort of thing, is if if you were, and even and even a little lower than that one, uh, just go down just a hair. Um, the the uh, the uh, th uh, there. So like, if if that section where you have that circuitry, if if you had that in kind of an oval shape like this, and and whether you had a spiral all the way through it or or a kind of a two of them. And you bent them just like this and made three of them. Uh, Could you superimpose them into this to create instead of a, a, a specific, you've got an you've got a force moving in a direction. I, I, I don't know where it would go with it, but I was thinking, and I'm not even sure about the logistics of, of overlapping it because these are open and, and that you would have a whole flat surface. I, you know, the, the whole logistics of bringing those three together of, of just an oval. And, and whether you had one big circuit or two inside it or however, I don't I don't have the the end to it. But I was just thinking a couple of those, and then you end up with this with a so they're not all even. They're they're kind of angling off each other. Well, I hear you. I hear you. But what I've what I've done is trying to finish up one thing at a time here. Uh, okay. It is intriguing to think about Don's structure, but the okay. reason see what Don has those loops going off the edge. I basically did away with the loops and this picture here, I'm, I'm putting them together as a framework. Um, now, this framework would ideally go all the way into the center. I've only did it by, I don't know, 10 turns, you know, very fine wire. And the other thing is these are also parallelized at the edges because two coils come together at an edge. And uh, that parallelization is actually a phenomenon that I was describing with the compass effect, that was one of the effects that I found with that. Um, and so I, I'm calling it parallelized, para, parallelized coil, bidirectional on spiraling plane. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the, yeah, the, all these effects can be tried. I can tell you, uh, I worked, uh, you know, very long hours trying to get all this in the last month or two, but um, I'd, I'd like to come back to it someday and keep going on with it. But yes, absolutely. Uh, the other thing is when you say making a long piece, what material will you use? Like 
to use printed oh. circuit material, it's not quite so flexible. It is a little bit flexible, but you don't want to put kinks in it. If you start I, bending it too hard or twisting it too hard, you're going to create kinks, and the kinks are going to be leakage, and they're, they're not going to, you're, you're going to misalign the magnetic fields. That, so, foiled, that foiled one that, that you had with the foil on it, um, yeah. uh, that was, uh, let's see, where's, uh, no, no, uh, yeah, keep going. Uh, that's the foil there. That one, yeah, that's what was, um, that was amazing. That's when I saw that was where I was, I was suddenly thinking of, of, of like a more of a long oval one or not. I, I don't know. It's just, yeah, that, yeah, that, that's pretty yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's paper on the outside. Yeah. Hey, uh, Joe. Joe. Are you familiar with uh, Adhesives Research Corporation out of Glen Rock, Pennsylvania? No, no. They, they make a double-faced foam tape, very thin, but it's used a lot for structural work. So you might want to look into them. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know how many samples that I've gotten from them on different, because they, they have, uh, you know, they'll even specialize and make tape for people that have the right adhesive strengths to be able to accomplish what you may want. So it might be of interest to you to contact them and just ask for some samples explaining <laughs> what you're trying to do. And they'll probably send you rolls and rolls of the stuff. Well, if you could write the name in the chat, I, I'll, be, I'll know what the spelling is to look up. <laughs> yeah, OK, I'll send it to you. Yeah, OK. Because it, it, it has a. In addition to the stickiness that you have of a double face tape, like the 3M tapes, this has a very thin foam between them, which means uh -huh. that when you press it down, you've got some variation in the in the piece. So it might be something a little, you know, give you some maneuverability and manipulation. But at the same time, you can get tackiness to where you can remove it. And then they make some tapes which are ultraviolet. So once you settle into what you want, all right, right. Then it sets the the tape so it now becomes permanent. Yeah, like those tooth fillings, right? <laughs> yeah. This this is the tape I'm actually using, the, the 3M. And well, here's 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 a one of my uh, structural adhesive research tapes that I have. Uh huh. You know. Yeah. No, I okay. love tape. I, I have a very big collection of tape. I'll, I'll probably look into that at some point. Yeah. <laughs> tape is fascinating. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. The, what, yeah. the work that you're doing is really great. Yeah. It's really great. Thank you. The other aspect that uh, <clears throat> is still on a back burner of mine, of a project I haven't started yet, <clears throat> but I've been doing similar things with AC current. Right. And the, you know, so the case where you've got four coils arranged in that tetrahedron, um, what I plan to do at some point in the future is to take two audio amplifiers, have the output of those amplifiers drive two of the coils, have the other two coils be the input of those audio receivers, cross coupled, and this powered on and let it interact with each other from an AC perspective. Right. Right. I think you, some of your YouTubes, at least a year ago, you had some YouTubes. You were making a motor, but did you not also do any of that audio coupling on one of those YouTubes? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the audio amplifier was the motor drive control circuit for the 3D amp for the 3D motor. Um, but what I want to do is, is take out the magnetic core that I had in, in my magnetic motor. So take the magnetic core out. And just let the transformer effect between adjacent coils cause a feedback loop between the input and output of the amplifier and just let it run wild on its own and see what kind of sustainable harmonics that the coils would develop. Once you've created one like an impulse on one coil, three adjacent coils are going to pick it up and amplify it and put it back into the system again. So you kind of get this you know, self-amplified audio circuit 
I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it would do, but it's something I've got on my to-do list to eventually get to, and it would be modeled, uh, you know, similar to what you have in your uh, tetrahedron coils. Now, with, with audio, with audio frequencies, you can make. See, that's like a four-branching kind of a core. You just uh, twist up some wires, or even uh, take some old tape recorder tape, you know, and sort of with tape kind of twist it up and make four branches, but. That's because the ferro uh, properties of the, that tape can take higher frequencies than can uh, this. This is just wire, metallic wire. You know that's really low frequencies. Yeah, we, I, you, you could run it at relatively low frequencies as long as your coils have roughly eight ohm impedance, in, in, like kind of like a speaker, right? If, so if the coils look like an audio speaker, then it's perfectly tuned for. The audio amplifier to run in that you know a couple hundred hertz to a couple thousand hertz. Yeah, this, this thing is just a, that's only five and a half yeah. ohms. So that's that's the problem there. <laughs> no, but five and a half is still manageable for an audio amplifier. Yeah, well, four ohm. When they have a four ohm output, it's just a question of the output transformer, right? But I, yeah. I, my stuff is all long, long unused. I, I can't get that. <laughs> that's just too much. Yeah, I, I'm with you though. I agree with you. Yeah. I'm just saying that my my stuff, my equipment is, you know, I have a, a lifetime of collection. I, I can barely, I, what I got to do is to clear up this room. It's just a mess right now. It just, uh, I mean, I can tolerate a lot of mess, but this has really outdone me. You know? so <laughs> I've, got to, I, I've got to get on with other projects. You have to take a look at my basement. You see the same thing. <laughs> well, we can if encourage each other. It's not that bad, is it? <laughs> If, well, I've, if, I've come to one conclusion. The only way to keep a shop clean is to never use it. Yeah. <laughs> and you miss out on all the experience. <laughs> right. If, 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 I, if I make the time to find some of these YouTube links on field and electric and, and, and how electricity is working, I, I'm, I'm hoping to post them into Mighty Networks. And I would love some feedback on people's opinion the good and the bad aspects of those so that that people learning about fields and electric and the relationships as sort of a uh, maybe from a primer on but there's a couple of interesting ones out there that are that talk about fields and and pointer and, the, and all of this but i'm not quite sure uh i don't want to take everything they say on faith without it being vetted by people that know stuff <laughs> that i that i don't know about the electrical field so um I've, I've seen a few online i'd love to post them um you know in, in olden days i would have thrown them into the meeting here but we're, we're picking up some you know in general but we're picking up such good momentum i was like oh wait a minute if i just post them out there so if if, if you guys that have a, a good understanding of that electric flow um get a chance and i still have to find them time folds like yesterday was last week um so actually one, one, one other piece of food for thought Bo, is um looks like you got a lot of spare electrical components around is to get some capacitors oh yeah and hook those up in in between the the coils to get that sort of tuned right because now if you put a combination of a capacitor and the inductor of the coil there's a natural harmonic frequency that that'll tune to yeah, that, that's the neat idea about using printed circuit boards. When you have this kind of, when they're all squeezed into this kind of a shape, you have a, a self capacitance between this coil and this coil, and it's shared all the way around between yeah. four of them. So you, you do have a lot of self capacitance, and that's another reason to use flat coils. Don't use the, uh, you know, the, the cylindrical type that are all double, triple, 100 times around. You have single layers. The single layers are like capacitor plates. And the other thing is about the tapes, you want the minimum space possible. We want to be as close as we can um, and uh, to keep it uh, diamagnetic so that we're not, uh, I mean, even air has uh, too much, too much uh, susceptibility to magnetism. So you, I want to keep one side of the coil uh, with no susceptibility as, as much as possible and the other side with good susceptibility. And that way to get a cleaner response. But, so, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the main advantage of using an external capacitor, you know, those big ones you find in a power supply, is it's going to lower the frequency down. 
because the, the inherent capacitance between those wires is going to be very high capacitance or very low capacitance, which is tuned to a high frequency. But the larger big can capacitors could lower the frequencies down to something more visible, more manageable, and um, do as high frequencies. A lot of things you can play with, a lot of dials you can get in there.